All right, looks like we have everybody here now. Uh, we're going to start the second talk of this session. Uh, the, our presenter is Richard Taggart from IBM, and he'll be talking about leveraging a custom CPython data model for high-performance microprocessor design. All right, off to you, Richard. Thanks, Bill. So I'm Rich Taggart. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm a senior engineer, and I'm speaking on behalf of the IBM EDA team. Today, I'd like to talk about how we used CPython to build a custom data model for high-performance microprocessor design. The first thing I'm going to talk about is I'm going to dive a little bit into how we build a microprocessor. These are very complicated devices. They require significant simulation and analysis to ensure that they'll work the way that we expect them to out in the real world after they're manufactured. This design process ends up generating a ton of information, which leaves us with a big data problem. We used CPython to create a custom data model which can efficiently store all of this design data and derived analysis data. I'm also going to share some examples of how we used the Python ecosystem to help us wrangle all of this data and analyze it. I'm going to wrap up with some things that we've learned along the way. Before we talk about microprocessor design, I thought it would be helpful to illustrate how complicated these devices really are. And we can see they've grown exponentially more complicated over the last half century. For context, the US roadway system has just under 130,000 intersections. Facebook had 2.1 billion active users at the end of last year. And modern microprocessors have on the order of 20 billion transistors with 100 billion connected wires all squeezed onto a piece of silicon roughly the size of a US quarter. Naturally, we need a special custom process and also specialized software to help us build these. The first process or the first step in designing a microprocessor is defining the microarchitecture. This contains all of the instructions that are used by operating systems and programs. One example is the add operation. The next step is to describe all of the logic required to implement that instruction. That logic then needs to be synthesized into a set of equivalent logical gates. Those gates need to be physically placed and wired together. Once we do this for all of the instructions in the microarchitecture, we end up with a working processor. It turns out that optimizing these designs to meet all of the performance, power usage, and size constraints that we have is a problem of similar complexity to the traveling salesman problem. These are some steps that we use to simulate and analyze the design and ensure that will, it will ultimately work the way we expect it to. This design process is not simply one and done. It requires multiple iterations where an engineer makes some changes. They run the new design through the synthesis and analysis workflow that I mentioned. That ends up generating a large pile of data and leaves our engineer with many questions, namely, what happened, why did it happen, and how do we improve the design for next time? It turns out these processors are so complicated, we can't analyze them all in one shot. We have to break the single design up into multiple hierarchical components, each of which are analyzed and optimized separately. And then we as engineers need to stitch that back together so that we can think of it as a single entity. And as you can see here, 
each iteration ends up generating a lot of data. I'm now going to dive into some of the details of how we built a custom data model to help us address this problem. Some key things to think about is that our engineers need to manage multiple versions of the design over time. They need to manage multiple separate hierarchical components. They need to have access to the design and derived analysis data. And they need to make sure the multiple teams working across these components are able to collaborate effectively. If you take a look at the picture on the right, throughout the design project, project, an engineer may end up running thousands of experiments. Let's consider one of these experiments where we have an EDA application running on one of our servers. That EDA application is built of multiple modules each of which corresponds to one of those steps in the design flow I mentioned earlier. All of these modules are connected together and end up generating their own set of data. An engineer then needs to review this information either manually or with the help of some scripting and automation. We've built a custom module which integrates directly into this EDA application to help us solve this problem. Design data, or DD, is a read-only, self-contained, binary file-based database. You can think of it as a graph database that's built specifically for processor design and stores all of the information in a single binary file. It efficiently stores design data, including the interconnected logical gates and wires, as well as derived analysis data, such as estimated signal delay, power usage, and the other examples shown here. If we consider our EDA application, one of these analysis modules may require 16 processor cores more than half a terabyte of memory, and up to eight hours to finish analyzing one of these design components. Our data model integrates directly into this EDA application so that at the end of the analysis, all of that data is written out into a compressed binary file. Afterward, an engineer can load all of that data into a Python process in less than five minutes. You may be looking at these pictures and thinking to yourself, this system seems pretty complicated. Are all of these layers here really necessary? Let's consider the example of a fully connected complete graph with 10,000 nodes and just under 50 million edges. A pure Python implementation took six minutes and more than eight gigabytes of memory to generate one of these graphs. An equivalent C++ implementation took less than four seconds and just over one gigabyte of memory to generate an identical graph. Using CPython to build a Python extension module allows us to have the best of both worlds, where our engineers can prototype quickly and answer questions that they have using Python and many of the packages available, while still relying on the efficient implementation of a C++ data model. So now that I've covered some details about how we built a data model, helping to address the big data problem that we have from the microprocessor design process. I'm going to spend the next several minutes walking through some examples of how we used Python in interesting ways to query this information and analyze the data available to us. The Python environment I mentioned earlier supports multiple engineering use models. We have dashboards that help address common tasks, including having quick access to operational metrics, as well as being able to perform 
visual discovery, and visual exploration. The system also supports less common tasks, including ad hoc analysis and being able to answer questions we may not yet even know that we have. Considering one of our dashboards, this allows an engineer to answer the question, what happened? You are looking at the number of failures reported for a given version of the design. This gives us some insight into what has happened over time and allows us to answer questions like, how did the new problems that are reported, how significant are they? The goal here is to form a mental model of the whole picture. This application is powered by a Flask web server, which uses pandas to efficiently process the data and quickly return it so that the application can render all of that information for the user. The next step is to dive into one of these bars and understand more details about a specific version of the design. This engineering view allows us to understand how specific aspects of the design have changed, giving us the ability to answer questions like, how did the boundary paths between my hierarchical components change? Or was there a major change in the architecture of the design, which ended up causing unintended side effects? This dashboard is powered by a WebSocket server, which already has the design data loaded into it. It can then quickly process and respond to requests as the users are trying to understand what's going on. This engineering view also allows us to answer the question, how do we fix the problems you reported? As we consider this example, imagine a high-speed highway of data signals running all the way across a microprocessor. Now imagine placing a construction zone right in the middle of that highway with a 30, that's interesting, mile an hour speed limit. I'm gonna just not touch this. All right, cool. Uh-oh. Awesome. Where was I? Now imagine a construction zone placed right in the middle of that high-speed highway with a 30 mile an hour speed limit. This engineering view allows an engineer to filter based on those slow data signals which are surrounded by high speed signals. This WebSocket server can find all of those points which were reported as failures and from those points, it can trace the longest path reporting all of the coordinates of the wires along the way. Consider the image on the right, which you can see sometimes it looks like. We'll take storage element B and move it just a little bit. Oh, I forgot to mention here. This image depicts a multi-cycle path which is taking a scenic route through multiple design components. If we take storage element B and move it just a little bit to the left so that it's in the same component as both A and C, we can then rerun the design through the optimization engine, which will do what it's really good at and fix the problem for us. Remember, each of these gray boxes here is a separate analysis and a separate component, which ends up generating its own set of data. We can load all of these DD files into the same process and view the information as if it was a single entity. This allows us to solve problems which would have been really hard and makes them actually pretty easy. The system also supports 
custom analysis, allowing users to answer questions such as, which slow data paths contain mostly slow signals? In this case, we can write a script which loads a DD file, iterates through all of the tests which are reported as failing, traces the longest path, and then aggregates some metrics, stuffs it all in a data frame, and renders the image that you see here on the right. Having all of this available in memory allows engineers to then filter and dive into the specific aspects of the data which are causing these unexpected anomalies. We can also load multiple DD files into a single process, allowing us to compare multiple versions of the data over time. This system has been completely invaluable in allowing us to identify significant systemic problems that show up in the design. I'm going to switch gears to a developer's experience. There was a case where some of our automated regressions ended up showing a whole bunch of differences that we weren't expecting. It also showed significant performance degradations. One was so bad that it never even finished, as you can see by the big red bars here. Naturally, this led us to asking the question, where is this poor runtime coming from? In fact, the process was still running, so we were able to log into the machine where it was running and attach a debugger. After looking at a couple of stack traces, we saw the same function showing up over and over again. The author confirmed, yeah, this is a pretty expensive operation, and you probably shouldn't call it too many times. Looking at some of the other performance data from the runs that had finished, we were able to confirm where the source was coming from, and also we were, oops, calling it way too many times. So fortunately, we were able to revert the patch that was causing this and go along on our merry way. We've built another utility which helps engineers process and figure out, are they making the changes in the code that's causing the output they're really expecting? In this case, our program reads in two data frames, merges them together, compares the relevant columns, in this case, diffs them, and then renders only the data values that are showing differences. This allowed us to quickly understand that either code changes were impacting things we weren't expecting them to, and we can also verify that we're only if impacting the data that we are expecting to. As a side note, if you're working in Pandas and manipulating data, I would highly recommend using a vectorized approach whenever you can. These four different approaches are listed in order from shortest runtime to longest. And we can see from the charts on the right, using a vectorized approach for data manipulation provides a 500x improvement over the loop-based methods. So now I'm going to wrap up by sharing some things that we've learned, starting with learning from the open source community and building our user interaction model around that. We have our active users who do what they usually do, and when they find a problem, they let us know about it, and also ask for enhancements or uh, ask us questions about the tool. The goal here is to ensure a low barrier to entry and make sure it's as easy as possible for people to get started. Moving along the spectrum, we have power users which can help answer questions and also start creating prototypes and experiments and maybe even some more complex features. The goal here is to make sure that it's as easy as possible for your power users to contribute to your project in whatever way makes sense for them. 
And lastly, we have the code maintainers and developers who are responsible for supporting and maintaining the system and setting project strategy. The goal here is to maintain a long-term engagement so that you can continue to leverage all of the learning and the deep knowledge that they've acquired with the project. This is one example of how we've enabled this use model where people can move along the spectrum over time in whatever way makes sense for them. And this has democratized the whole analysis process for us in microprocessor design. So hopefully by this point you're thinking, this is pretty cool and I'd like to get something like this. Well, you could make one. If you're not familiar with Python, I assume most of us here are, I would recommend starting with these references. I find these very useful. And this is the first place that I go. Whenever I have a question with Python, I go here first. And if I can't find my answer, then I'll go to Stack Overflow or to a search engine. Similarly, I found these references really helpful for C and C++. If you're familiar with both, maybe you want to consider creating an extension module. The tutorials are great, and we have found that once you start doing more complex things, you can, um, it can be a little bit more difficult to find exactly what you're looking for, especially if you move away from the pre-canned examples that are available there. So what have we learned? Building an ecosystem on top of Python and using C Python has been a complete game changer for us in microprocessor design. It allows us to take advantage of all of the tools that are available and really focus on the hard problems. So with that, thank you, everyone. <laughs>